Hello, and welcome to The Public. I'm Kevin Canners. In Tenno 4, the new novel by my guest Ben Lerner, the narrator and central character, has just been awarded a large advance based on the unexpected success of his previous novel, learned he has a dangerous health condition that threatens his life, and has been asked by his best friend if he will help her conceive a child. Said in New York, or as the narrator puts it, The Sinking City, and bookended by two hurricanes, Irene and Sandy, Tenno 4 follows the narrator as he navigates through life on the cusp of these multiple different futures. Tenno 4 also happens to draw on a framework that mirrors much of Ben Lerner's own life. Like the narrator, Ben Lerner's first and previous novel, Leaving the Atocha Station, was an unexpected success. Despite being from a small independent publishing house and having an initial run of only 3,500 books, Leaving the Atocha Station was heralded by the literary establishment and found its way into many of the year's best of lists. Playing heavily with the line between fiction and reality, now in 1004, as the reader, it's hard to know where reality ends and fiction begins, how far the similarities go between the narrator as a character and Ben Lerner himself. The book, deftly weaved and developed, meditates on the role of art, of new possibilities of collectivity, and looks at how the shape of the present can so strongly be impacted by the stories we tell ourselves about the future and the past. Before writing his first novel, Ben Lerner was already a successful poet, having published three collections of his poetry and winning acclaim for his work. His writing has been published in Harper's and The New Yorker, and he's also currently a professor of English at Brooklyn College. Here's our conversation. Well, Ben Lerner, welcome to the public. Thanks for having me. Now, your new novel, 1004, is based on a theme that could be loosely described as your own experience. The the narrator isn't isn't of course you, but it borrows a lot from uh, experiences you've had in your own life. And in fact, the the whole book plays with the idea of fiction reality and the blending of those two. What made you want to look at that as a theme? I mean, to a certain degree, I think that all fiction uses the material of lived experience, right? Like even if you're writing from the perspective of an other, you're still, you know, you're still using the material of your own experience to project the possibilities of another mind. And and since I'm kind of interested in the way experience becomes fiction and the way that we live fictions, like the way that fictions can have real effects in our life, I wanted to kind of explore the scene um, between reality and fiction to make that kind of explicitly part of the work. So, I mean, for me, having a kind of flickering edge between what's fact and fiction within the work allows you to meditate on the significance of fiction making in our own lives. So would you say that it's a false dichotomy that that we have in general society, that there is a the strong sort of divide between the two? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how much we even have a sense of a strong divide now, right, with kind of the obsession with reality TV that everybody knows isn't real or fake news being more reliable than the so-called real news. I mean, there's a lot of anxiety about how to tell apart um, kind of manipulative, spectacular media fictions on the one hand and what counts as real experience. So there's a kind of contemporary anxiety about the collapse of that dichotomy. But on the other hand, I feel like that's a really traditional concern of the novel. Like when I read Stendhal, who's a really important novelist for me, he, you know, his characters are always like wandering around, wondering if they've really, uh, where, where Fabrice is, is wandering around the battle of Waterloo. And he keeps saying like, have I been in a real war yet? Like what, like when, when do I know I've made contact with history? So I, I think there's a kind of fundamental human anxiety about what counts as authentic experience. Um, that's that's really fundamental to the novel as a form, and I think that that for a lot of writers now, you know, the novel because it's so good at depicting consciousness um, and internal experience is a form that can kind of examine the felt disconnect between what's going on in our own minds and what's going on in the world. So, you know, to a certain degree, the 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 way we live reality is always a fiction. It's how we organize a massive experience into a meaningful whole. So I think that that, and I don't think there's ever a stable dichotomy between fact and fiction. Yeah, I, I think that it's always a, a shifting border and that fiction can kind of examine what it was like for that border to shift. Yeah, it's interesting. I think you're right that there's an awareness now 
because of reality TV and, and various things that a lot of what we take in might not be wholly truth. Um, but the on the other hand, the other side of that equation of the way fiction impacts our own lives in terms of the stories we tell ourselves, that, that feels like it might not have the, quite the same awareness. Do you, do you think that's true too? Yeah, I think that probably is true. I mean, you know, for me, fiction isn't a word that means an alternative to reality. Fiction is a word for the way we organize reality into, you know, into some kind of coherence. And I think that, you know, the the literary critic Frank Kermode wrote this beautiful book called The Sense of an Ending, and he distinguished between like two kinds of fictions. One was myth, and myth was when you kind of forgot that your story was just a story and you took it for reality. You know, then something becomes a myth. And a fiction is a kind of self-conscious organization of reality where you know that you're seeing in the world, you're seeing the world one way, but it could also be seen another way. And what my book is kind of interested in is what happens when the fictions we use to make sense of the world shift. So there are all these kind of stories within the book where people's realities are, are suddenly reorganized. Like, you know, a woman realizes the man she thought was her father was not her father. And it kind of causes this big reevaluation of her, of, of her identity or there are other, other versions of that kind of story. So I mean, I think that I think that fiction really should be understood not as a word for an escape from reality, but but that fiction is a technology for making contact with reality. And fictions have real effects, you know. I mean, and that's part of what this book examines. Like, you write a book, even if it's kind of made up, it then becomes a fact in the world, and it affects your relations, you know, your relationships with people. So, yeah, I really think of fiction more as something we live by, as opposed to an alternative to our real lives. And it's interesting because that's uh, in the book, it's playing with the idea that the fiction that the narrator wrote, which I, I'm sure is true in your own life, too, ended up changing his, his real life. I, I can't remember the exact passage or the exact wording, but at one point he's meditating on the fact that based on a fiction he's written in the past, he's being given an advance that will help through helping pay for fertilization treatments, pay for a possible future. Exactly right. I mean, he, he gets he gets a book advance based upon his previous fiction that he's using to fund the fertility treatments of his best friend. So a big, you know, a big thing in the novel is the way that um, all of these different kinds of futurity start to compete and interact, like literary futurity or the strange way that money and time combined so that he's kind of getting he's getting money for work he hasn't yet made in order to possibly help a friend have a child and so kind of all these different orders of temporality and experience keep interfering and kind of separating and you know one one of the kind of points of the book right is that the the big fiction that we're always telling is, is, the, is our imagined projection about the future that so intensely determines our experience of the present. And one of the things the book tries to track is the way our experience of the present always shifts in relation to the future we imagine or the impossibility of imagining a future, you know, in a, in a context of environmental degradation. And, and also the narrator has had this, has this very scary medical diagnosis, so his own biological fragility or his own ability or inability to imagine his embodied future is another kind of anxiety in the book. But I think, I mean, in terms of our conversation about fiction and reality, I think that it's worth remembering that the future, which is necessarily a fiction, right? I mean, it literally hasn't happened yet, um, so intensely determines the texture of the present. So in that sense, we always live in relation to a fiction. What do you mean by that? Do you mean that in terms of where we imagine we're going, it, it colors what we're experiencing at the at the moment? Yeah, I just I just mean that you know when when you when you walk around a city, the city you experience is totally different if you if you believe you're going to die in five years from a medical condition, or if or if you're having children, or if you believe the city's going to be durable, or if it feels fragile because of sea level rise. That just the, the texture of the present is very much shot through with our imagination of the of the future. And and I you know I don't pretend that's like my idea. I mean I think that's just a fact of experience. So, you know, in this book, as he, as he moves around New York, as he tries to figure out if he'll be a father, or, you know, what kind of literature is he going to write, or what's the future of a city increasingly susceptible to superstorms or whatever, he really feels all these different 
that the kind of present flickers and shifts in relation to his different imaginations of the future or his anxiety about whether or not there is a viable future. Is that an anxiety you share? Yeah. I mean, is it, I feel like it's kind of an anxiety, it's an anxiety everybody shares. I mean, to a certain degree, I think that's just, you know, that's just what it means to be human and have some conception of, of what's to come. But I also think, you know, I think there are plenty of reasons to be particularly anxious about the durability of the world. In the book, right, like, that's not, grounds for despair like you know capitalism and the kind of american empire feels very fragile to him in a new way as it does to me and that also causes him to, to, to feel like there's a glimmer of other kinds of social possibilities you know that like um that e even when when there's like an imminent catastrophe like a storm there's this kind of glimmer of sociality that, that as people come together around it he has the sense that that you know, there's more than one possible world that we could imagine forms of social connection that aren't dictated, you know, by markets and price or whatever. So, the novel is kind of about seizing these glimmers of utopian potential in the midst of all of these uh, anxieties about the future. I mean, that the the good side of a vulnerable future is that you feel like the world could be different. You feel like things, in an important sense, up for grabs. Yeah, I, I, one of the most interesting parts that I found in the book was when you're describing that sort of electric sense in the air that when it feels in face of an approaching storm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the book is bookended by by two storms, which are kind of versions of Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy, and and in both instances, yeah, as you say, there's a, there's a kind of electricity in the air. I mean, you know, it's 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 really interesting in this city, like in New York you know, so much of your life depends upon kind of these partitions in social space because everybody's on top of everybody. And so you kind of have to have, you know, you kind of have to separate yourself so that you can feel sane. So you share a lot of physical space, but there's also a lot of kind of privacy. But when something like a hurricane starts to approach, right, then suddenly those partitions in social space break down and you can talk to anybody and neighbors who basically ignored each other, you know, start casually having conversations and he's interested in how that could be just a little fragment of a different social world and it does charge the air um, with electricity and it's complicated because it's it's a, it's a kind of uh, euphoria or social possibility that's produced by a sense of imminent disaster and so it's not all good certainly but it's also not all bad and, and what what I'm interested in what what I think fiction can do is not just kind of give us more reasons to despair about the disaster of the contemporary on the one hand, or give us just a kind of escape from reality where you get to feel like you're, you know, you're entertained in, al in an alternative universe, but to try to kind of seize those little particles of possibility that are present in even the most, um, you know, kind of scary scenario. I feel like that's, that's kind of, you know, that that's one of the chief concerns of the book. Is how art can help make us realize that possibility? Yeah, that, that, that art, that art in part is a way of being alive to the, to the glimmers of potentiality in the, in the midst of the mundane on the one hand, right? Like he just is kind of attuned to how miraculous and strange you know, the economy is just the circulation of goods and informations and bodies. Like it all becomes strange and visible to him precisely because it's threatened. And, and yeah, I think art is a way of attending to the present um, with an intensity that it's difficult to achieve when you're just locked in the rhythms of the mundane day, you know. Yeah, uh, the point you're talking about is he, he picks up at one point before the storm is going to hit a thing of instant coffee and suddenly he feels both the, the wonder and absurdity of, of this global thing that, that saw this coffee grown in South America, you know, processed somewhere else, for yeah. taking my ship. And then it's interesting how that possibility is erased once the storm doesn't hit. Right, 
Right. Yeah. I mean, cause that's kind of back into the theme of like fictions with real effects, you know, it's strange. Like you, you have this, when the first storm that really doesn't arrive, you know, hurricane, which is based on hurricane Irene, which was a, a big scary buildup and then it kind of dissipated. So it, it didn't end up in New York being a very big deal. It's a big deal in plenty of other places, but but yeah, I mean, the storm ended up being a fiction about the future, right? Like it wasn't real in the way it was anticipated. And his question is kind of like, well, what what happened to that sociality that was predicated on the idea of this imminent disaster? Like suddenly it's kind of like that sociality never happened, but on the other hand, it's not nothing. You know, it, it, the storm was a fiction that produced a possibility, even though that that possibility was fleeting and yeah and like you know he he's he's overwhelmed by the miracle and craziness of this can of instant coffee and i I actually think that's like you know that an important theme in the book is like how can we be aware of how all of these um bad forms of collectivity in a certain sense like a commodity that depends on a lot of exploitation and a kind of global circuit or you know things he talks about like like just like the way that there are you know, trace amounts of antidepressants in the municipal water or whatever. He he wants to be an artist who sees in those bad forms of collectivity the possibility of a better form of connection, you know, and an, like an alternative to just thinking of ourselves as alone and atomized and instead actually imagining, like, to put it really simply, like, we're in this together. And is there a way that art can help us look at the mundane ways our fates are connected in order to kind of um, make us aware of alternative possibilities of interconnection? And and not to draw the point too finely, but is that in the back of your mind? Is that is that your goal? Is that the reason why you see art as, as meaningful? Is to try to yeah. get that sense of collectivity? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, there, there's... Art, art is a, a various thing, and there, and there are all there are all kinds of reasons to to love it or not love it, depending on the artist and the and the kind of art object in question. But yeah, for me, I mean, yeah, like I, I it doesn't seem responsible or interesting to me to produce literature that that wants to just turn its back on the world on the one hand. And it also doesn't seem interesting to just like kind of write an ironic book or a book that's a reason to despair. Like we don't need more examples of reasons to despair. It seems to me that art, art is in part about in a clear eyed way, like being aware of the present, but also finding possibilities of wonder um, or spaces for the imagination because that's, you know, that's what's necessary to be able to conceive of alternative futures. And I don't make any like big claims for literature or certainly not my literature, like it's going to change the world. But I, I, I do think that it can, you know, that, that an experience of art can, can help restore your sense of possibility as opposed to feeling like kind of doom or capitalism or markets or whatever is the only way of thinking and feeling that we have available to us. I mean, I, I, it sounds grander than I mean it to sound, right? I mean, I also think it like it can be funny or entertaining, or, you know. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, I think that's important. There's a part of the book that is actually uh, based on uh, an essay you wrote in Harper's Magazine about this exhibit. Uh, maybe you can describe it, actually, but basically a, a damaged art and the yeah. value it has. Could you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, there's this amazing woman in New York named Elka Krajewska who managed, who founded this thing called the Salvage Art Institute. And basically, I mean, I had never really thought about what happened to artworks that were damaged, but I kind of thought they were just destroyed, you know. But instead, these artworks are, of course, insured, right? Because the art's worth a lot of mo- a lot of art is worth a lot of money, and so it gets moved around. And there's there's this huge insurance company that basically handles that. And when art is damaged like in transit or from a fire or a flood or maybe vandalism or whatever, the art, just like a car or any other object, is often declared to be totaled and to have zero value. And I thought that art was destroyed, but instead it's actually like kept in this giant warehouse in Long Island, basically. And Elka Krajewska convinced the insurer to basically give her a huge archive of this 
um, totaled art of this art that had been proclaimed to have zero value in the market. And then she kind of collected a bunch of this art and invited people, writers and of all different sorts and philosophers and artists or whatever to come and kind of talk about it. Like, you know, what are these objects now, now that they've been declared no longer art by an insurance company? And so some of these objects were like really clearly damaged. They're torn up or slashed or whatever, and you could see the damage. And they might be beautiful still or even more beautiful by virtue of the damage, but you could tell it happened. But what really moved me when I went and saw the collection Elka had compiled was that there were also all these works that looked exactly the same to me. Like I just, I couldn't see any damage. You know, there were these photographs that he had like the smallest imperceptible alteration that an expert could see, but that my maybe comparatively unsophisticated eye couldn't perceive. And I thought this was really amazing that these that these objects had gone from being worth an immense amount of capital to being worth no money according to the market while looking like the same work of art. And what moved me about it is it was kind of like it was kind of like an artwork that had survived capitalism. It was like an artwork from another world suddenly. And, you know, you can, since it had been declared zero value, you can hold this work. You know, you can, you could touch the art, you could um, hand it back and forth amongst friends or whatever. So it, what it made me think about was not the vulnerability of art objects, right? Like things can break, but in a way like the vulnerability of price and the market like in fact the same object could be kind of freed from the logic of the market and there it is in your hand and it's a and you no longer think of it as a sculpture that's worth x amount of dollars you think of it as an object freed from the logic of the market and so it was just this really bizarre kind of potential space that her work kicked out and then i i wrote about it in a different context for harper's and then i kind of put it into the novel because it's so involved with the narrator's concerns about being able to see possibility in the objects that are at hand for a life that isn't just dictated by price and market logic. Yeah, as it says in the, the book, freed from the tyranny of price. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because price... Price is just a really bankrupt way to measure the value of the things we love, and it's just also kind of the only available measure, you know. And 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 this this links back up to the advance and the kind of absurdity of trying to think about fertility or having a child in relation to how much money you could get for a book advance. I mean, you know, price is not really a sufficient measure of value. It's it's one it's one way of measuring value, but it makes everything exchangeable, right? Like, you know, if you, it allows you to, to say how many new cars your, your book is worth or how many fertility treatments or how many hours of minimum wage. And, and that kind of condition of abstract exchange, to my mind, is really dangerous. You know, I mean, that, that's, that is a very dehumanizing and ultimately insufficient way of interacting with the world. And what something like... Elka Krajewska's project does is makes you think about other measures of value. It's like, okay, you can't say this sculpture is valuable because it's worth $20,000 anymore. Here, it's the same sculpture, but you can, for all intents and purposes, but you can hold it in your hand. How do we talk about it now? And those moments where you can get out of the logic of price are like increasingly few and far between. And, and I kind of think it's that art is an instrument for locating and advancing alternative measures of value. How, how do you think we got to this point? Like, do you think it's reached a climax of, of the measurability of, of things? Or do you think there's, I mean, there seems to be some slow progress against beating this idea back, but with standardized testing and GDP, and uh, on the one hand, it seems like we're right. more obsessed than ever with, with measuring and, and valuing things in a, in a very, you know, as you say, um, sort of monetary or specific way. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole kind of history of capitalism of which I, I only have my own partial grasp. And it's a really good question about how, how we got here. I mean, I think there are lots of different factors. But I, I do think that the result of that, though, is that increasingly people realize that's just like not a way to measure the world, right? Like, you're not going to solve the problem of ecological catastrophe if you think about land 
exclusively in terms of the extraction of profit. Like it doesn't work that way. Like property rights uh, aren't going to aren't going to protect the planet, and so people are having to think again. I mean, are always thinking, but certainly thinking again about what you know. What about the commons? What about you know ways of thinking of value that that aren't just about the extraction of profit? So. You know, for me, it's like, on the one hand, it, it can feel t- total. You know, it can feel like every single second of our life is dominated by price. But on the other hand, you know, there are, all, there are moments, I think, that escape that system. Like, I, I, I think that, you know, when you break bread with a friend or whatever, there's, there's a moment of camaraderie or possibility there that escapes market logic. And that that for me, a kind of politically engaged art is about seizing those moments or dilating those moments or expanding those moments and making them felt as, you know, so that it doesn't feel like the only way to interact with people is through your, you know, your debit card or whatever. Has has it been uh, difficult at all? I mean, now that you have, you know, the success of the first book and now this book, I mean, it'd be so natural to view it in terms of how many books sold and, and comparison and trying to yeah. to judge the value based on those merits. I mean, for me, like it would be the number of downloads or listeners. Uh, it's so hard to ignore that type of, of metric. And in the book, there's yeah. a, a one section where the, the narrator is on a panel, I think at Columbia or another place, and they're talking about how the impulse behind poetry shouldn't be for price or for success but to try to say something and then they go to a dinner afterwards where despite what they had just said the the conversation is basically about who uh got what advance for what type of book right right exactly yeah and i mean i so i don't think there's any pure escape from the book is like you know the book is a commodity too and i just think that the question you know but a good book isn't just a commodity right like there's something in it that exceeds that form i mean so for for me, it, it's been actually kind of like weird. You know, I was a poet and kind of in the poet first, and poetry is somewhat protected from the kind of like market considerations by just being so marginal relative to the market, right? I mean, it's just like it always has a kind of DIY feel to it. Um, and, you know, when, when I started very unexpectedly to get attention for prose, the kind of question of the imagined audience or commerce or whatever did become important for me. And this book is, is kind of unusual for like really explicitly talking about book advances and the kind of strange nature of the, of the literary economy. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to imagine making literature or whatever that could reach a lot of people. I just think it's really important that you don't only think in quantitative terms. Like, you have to think in qualitative terms, right? Like, like five 500 or whatever number of, like, really careful readers or readers who really care about the, the work. Like, that's a real, that's a community. Like, that's a, you know, that's worth more than than a great number of, of sales or whatever of people who just kind of have your book because it becomes fashionable to have it on the shelf or on the table or whatever. So I think readership, I think readership has to be qualitative or, you know, any kind of audience has to be thought of in, in qualitative and not just quantitative terms. But, but, you know, that doesn't mean that, that I, that I'm just like indifferent to, you know, to the number of, of people who might engage my work. And I feel really lucky and also really baffled that my strange novels are, are getting more, you know, attention than, than I ever, than I ever expected. But the thing is, for me, the really important thing is that, you, you know, nobody's ever said to me, you know, can you make this change to your book? Because I think it'll sell more copies or whatever. I've just, I've been really lucky to be left alone to be as you know weird a writer as I am and I think that the real danger is if a writer or an artist or whatever is really instead of kind of responding to the demands of the form is responding to to an imagined market right where like people are kind of crowdsourcing their decisions like I'm going to write this kind of book because I think it's going to sell the greatest number of copies and that's it's just not a it's not a way to make serious art. Sometimes people make great art that does, you know, capture something about the moment and that does get a lot of 
readers or listeners. It's not like I don't think there can I think there can be great art that's also popular art, but I, I think that that has to happen um, not as a result of somebody trying to, you know, fulfill a demand that exists in advance. I think it happens because you have a singular vision that actually catches, you know, fire in some way. So one of the most interesting meditations that occurs in the book is some of the peculiarities of our, of our time, especially in the role that technology plays. Um, the narrator of, of the book talks about how some of the most um, important moments of his life occurred not through any grand uh, event or moment or meeting with someone else. It happened through <laughs> reading uh, a message that he got on his LCD screen on a smartphone. Uh, right. And another thing that uh, you, you play with in the novel is um, the way we use Google now, where the narrator will just search something up on Google, be like, I just looked this up now. I can tell you that I just read the Wikipedia page. Why did right. you want to take a look at the role technology is playing uh, right now in the novel? Well, I mean, I think that technologies, you know, the, the changes in the structure of technology are changes in the structure of perception. And they, they, they re-describe our experience of space and time. And, and so I feel like, a novel that wants to capture something about contemporary reality has to be true to the different ways where, you know, we're traversing space or sending information across time. And, you know, I mean, some writers I've heard talk about, you know, people who write like historical fiction, like not wanting to ever have to read a novel in which text messaging takes place. But for me, I mean, the great thing about the novel as a technology is it can depict the changing relationship to other technologies. So for me, I think about like Proust, like Proust has these incredible scenes of the first, like the first time he speaks on a telephone and like here is a, you know, I think it's his grandmother's disembodied voice or, or, or what, you know, what the motor car does to the experience of the countryside or the first time he sees an airplane. I mean, so one of the great things about the, the novel is that it can track all these changes in time and space as they're affected by the development of new, of new technology. So I don't know what it would mean to realistically depict social life and experience if you didn't, you know, acknowledge all these strange, you know, new experiences. And also they, they affect the experience of writing. I mean, that's part of why the narrator is explicit about like using Google is because the most writers I know, not all, but, but most, and certainly myself, like it's hard to separate composition from these new technologies. Like most of us are writing, you know, on the same computer we use to, check the weather or the the news or correspond with friends or or whatever. And so um, it's both about changes in the structure of experience that the novel describes, but also about changes in the structure of novelistic composition itself. Uh, it's interesting, actually, I, I can confess it had the same effect of, on me uh, on the other side of the equation. As a reader, after reading about the uh, the Challenger accident, I instantly went to the internet and started re- reading the Wikipedia page. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or seeing the videos, you know, and just the way that, you know, um, you know, like one of the things in the novel is it talks about how at least Americans all report, like huge numbers of Americans report having watched the Challenger disaster live as it happened. And in fact, like very few people saw it because it was only carried on CNN, which was a very young network then because it was like kind of during the work and school day. And it's it's amazing the degree to which there can be these kind of collective memories of things that actually we've seen after the fact on some kind of recording technology. So the book is also really concerned with the way collective fictions get produced by these technologies in part, right? And like how they, how they form either the movie back to the future, right? Where you kind of know it's art or, or things like a CNN replay where you kind of misremember it as if you were there or as if you at least saw it live, you know, those, those go deep into the structure of a generation's consciousness. I, I'm tempted to ask, do you have the same false memory of seeing it live? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I not only had a false memory of seeing it live, like I thought that I could remember my whole class watching it and, and, um, everything else, but I didn't see it. I saw it, uh, I saw it at, at night on the news. 
you know, also it was different then, like then, you know, now if there's, if there was something like a televised disaster, everyone would see it immediately on the screen they carry in their pocket. But this was still when like you had to wait to actually, you know, get into the physical presence of your a mobile television. Um, I really do remember clearly watching the Reagan speech with my family, you know, a speech that shows up in the, in the book. But yeah, I have all kinds of false memories that I think come from television and, and, and movies. I mean, that's how myth works, right? It, it's, this, it's this kind of collectively formed screen image that isn't a reality, but has real effects. What do you think there is a, a temptation among some authors to sort of askew the idea that a novel would have something like text messaging included in it or referenced in it? Why do you think there's a temptation among some to, to pretend that's not there? Well, I mean, it's just, a, I think that for a lot of people, what fiction means, what like literature is supposed to be an escape, right, from from the real. So, like, you, you there are a lot of people who want to read um, books or see movies or whatever that, that don't resemble uh, the kind of shifting and chaotic and contingent nature of the contemporary. So, I, I think that if, if, if your interest is to be transported to some other realm, that, that there can be this kind of desire to move away from all the complex technologies of the present. But I mean, there, there, I, I've read great books, of course, that people are writing now that are set in the past or whatever, but it, it's really not my primary interest. Like, I don't think that great literature tends to be produced by avoiding, uh, you know, the technologies of the present. And I also just think it's like, it's not the role of the artist to say like, oh, the internet's good or bad. Like it's, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. It's just a historical fact. It's power isn't diminished by saying it's good or bad. And what's more interesting is, is trying to actually like take the measure of how it's, um, you know, affecting lived experience. So I just think it's, it's always in flux and it's always unpredictable, but literature should be alive to it and not, you know, not afraid of it. What's, what's the point of, of trying to deny it, I guess? I don't, I'm not sure I quite get it, unless it's a fantasy of escape. And um, I have plenty of fantasies of escape, but they're not what I look to literature for. <laughs> Throughout the book, I, I kept getting struck about how um, the reader, at least I was, keep getting drawn into various paradoxes, being mulled over by by the narrator. I mean, there's there's how fiction can impact real life, which can impact fiction, how a change in the present, new information can completely change our conception of the past, which then could mm -hmm. impact the future, how acknowledging one's inauthenticity can make one in a way authentic. And in your uh -huh. last novel, too, it was a, a one of the main themes is how um, wanting to have a profound experience of art and being moved by that in, in an odd way uh, makes one have a, a profound experience of art. Yeah. yeah. Is, is this something you're just naturally drawn to? Like, uh, do you go walk around and, and have paradoxes uh, in the back of your mind uh, most of the time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the paradoxes or... I mean, I think kind of central with like all those different things, right, is the, is the, the way that... Um, kind of the way projection works, right? That you, when you stand before a work of art, you're both, you're both having, you know, an individual experience and you're also positioning yourself in relation to what's expected of you socially. Like, I think it's kind of the dialectic between the individual and the social that's active and all those things, you know, that your, your identity, instead of being like stable, like, you know, you're, you're a person who, who has a certain kind of relationship to art. It's just always in flux and it's, it's, um, it's a shifting set of pressures and intensities that has to do with what's expected of you socially and, and your own individuality. And instead of, you know, instead of thinking that your individuality is stable over time, there's a kind of sense of the, the fluidity of your own identity so that what's authentic um, isn't necessarily just this kind of uncritical presentation of who you are. What authenticity is this kind of complicated process of figuring out your relation to the social. So I guess what I mean is to say that I, I think that 
that the paradox, like for me, the word is kind of that it's that it's dialectical, that it's all that it's always that the contradictions of contemporary life are the sites of authenticity, that it's not about resolving contradictions or paradoxes. It's about being honest about the way we live them. And I think I feel that. I mean, I feel like each of us is kind of a walking tissue of contradictions and to live authentically is to is not to pretend to resolve them but to to really be attuned to the to the shifts um and experience that happen when you when you kind of navigate the world and when the world you know obviously forms and reforms you i don't know if that makes any sense i i think that that for, for me yeah, for me, literature, like life, is about um, being open to the to the contradictions of experience, as opposed to papering them over or offering false solutions. I mean, there's also an authenticity that can come. I, I feel from just not being aware of of the contradictions, if you know what I mean. Like it's almost it feels like yeah. you almost go through a stage where by trying to resolve the contradictions, you become more obviously inauthentic. Do yeah, you know what I mean, I. Mean, I yeah, I do know what you mean. I mean, I, I think they're kind of like they're twin traps, right? I mean, there's kind of being uh, too uncritical or too critical. You know, like one is one is stupidity and one is neurosis, right? And that they can kind of pass into each other. And I, I think either pole is a danger. I mean, I think that, you know, you know, for example, to be an artist unaware of the contradictions of art making and the way you're involved in a system and 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 the way that you're caught up and and complicit in a system that that is responsible for you know I just mean it being like a privileged artist that's that's responsible for all kinds of murderous things like being totally unaware of that. I mean, that seems to me just irresponsible. I just, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine serious work coming out of that position. On the other hand, if you're just kind of aware of all the things you can't do and how uh, saturated art is with guilt and despair, like so that your work just becomes kind of an ironic exercise in the impossibility of making artwork, that also seems totally useless to me. So I think it's about navigating that space between um, a kind of innocence and cynicism, in which neither is really a useful position. You kind of have to avoid them as you go, I think. But I can't imagine really celebrating either, either pole as authentic. Uh, one of the most interesting sentences uh, in the book that has sort of uh, stayed with me is that uh, we are not identical to ourselves. C- could you tell me your thoughts on, on that line? Yeah, I mean, that's like kind of what I meant about the paradoxes, right? That we're not, you're never a stable, asocial individual, you know, that who's just, who just is who he is. Like you're, you're a person produced by your social relationships and the person whose sense of self and identity is always going to change in relation to your um, imagined future or your narrative about the past. So, I, you know, in the book, the fact that we're not always identical to ourselves is both like a source of um, possibility and of fear. Like there are all these stories about people who you know, um, someone who who realizes he's been in a relationship with someone who who he thought was dying of a cancer, and it ends up it was faked. And th- those are very scary moments where you feel reality kind of crumbling under your feet. But there's also the assertion that you know the fact that reality is a fiction always subject to revision, the fact that identity is always in flux, is also a source of possibility because it means that you know, that we can re-describe the world. And it, it, it means that the the boundaries of self and other can always be withdrawn. So I think there's both something vertiginous and potentially scary, but also something really um, utopian and full of potential about the fact that, that we're never identical to ourselves over time. Can I ask you about your actual writing process? I mean, so much of what you've talked about in terms of the importance you see in art is is being open to the possibilities and, and giving us a way to to see a different future and to imagine a different way of, of being and thinking. How does that connect in with the actual process of, of writing? Um, do you feel open to the possibilities while you're writing? Do you have a, a structure? Yeah, I mean, for me, writing, it's this weird... It's this weird mixture of like wanting to be present and also wanting to disappear. Like you, you like of emptying yourself out so that the language can speak through you. You know, the poet Jack Spicer always talked about the poet as a kind of radio. 
You know, like it's, it's, it's about receiving messages. Who knows where they come from? And in Spicer's metaphor, it's like you're, you're, the Martians are speaking to you or whatever, or in the classic kind of mode of an, an antiquity and inspiration, it's like the gods are speaking through you. Like I don't have anything as grand as Martians and gods, but I do have this sense that the weird thing about writing is that to a certain degree you're controlling the language, but to a certain degree the language is controlling you. And you have to be kind of susceptible to both possibilities as you write. And I don't really know how it works. Like the best and worst thing about it is you never figure it out. You know, like by virtue of having written a poem in the past, it doesn't really mean you're going to write another one somehow. Um, you know, and, and I'm really jealous of people who like have a craft or whatever, where it just seems like they only get better like the more they practice, like it, it seems less predictable with writing. It seems like the fact of having written a book that you might be happy with or whatever, it, it doesn't guarantee that you're ever going to write another one. So the mystery is the best and worst thing about composition. But I, I do think it's a mixture. It's a mixture of, um, of your intentions and your receptivity to the intentions of the language and just the way that you become a kind of conduit for a moment. You know, if you're in it too much, I think the work ends up being kind of false because it, you, you, you were trying to control it. But on the other hand, you have to have some control or it's formless. So it's a weird, it's a weird process. I frankly don't understand. And it drives me crazy half the time. It drives you crazy so, yeah. because you don't know how to get to that, that spot or the yeah, uncertainty of I mean, it. Yeah, I mean, almost all my, I mean, there's some exceptions, like, you know, but, but, but most, most of the writers I know feel like kind of constantly in crisis. Yeah, I mean, because you get up in the morning and you sit down and then it's kind of like, well, how do I do this again? You know, like, I, like, I know, like, I don't really have a, I mean, the only stable element of my writing process is that I read and I think of reading and writing as really inextricable and I try to steal and I play with language and I kind of, you know, Zizek, who's not somebody I normally look to for advice has this kind of great thing where he talks about how the way he starts writing is he like sits at the computer, but he tells himself he's not writing. He kind of just plays around on the keys and he keeps saying to himself, like, I'm not working. I'm not writing. I'm just kind of like playing the piano. And then slowly the work kind of starts to emerge. You know, you kind of start to get a sense of the work as if it has a life of its own. There's some, there's some truth to that, but it's very difficult to figure out in the abstract what the conditions are to, to make it to make it happen. So sometimes, you know, nothing happens. And, and um, have you do you have a come to a philosophy on that? Do you do you try not to not to, to try in a way or try not to write? I think I, I it's not that I, I think that the way I the kind of my neurotic version of it is like I like I'll be like oh I'm this isn't a novel I'll be like I'm not writing a novel I'm just playing around here you know or here I'm going to write some sentences but I'm not working on a story or I'm here here are some phrases but it's not a poem and then that that allows me to actually start the novel or the poem or whatever and then I I kind of see a possibility like maybe the inkling of a form and then I can explore it but. But how you go from zero to the work of art, it's just like I never, you never figure it out. I never figure it out anyway. I'm sure there are people who have some kind of reliable strategy, but for me, it's always, it's always a little mysterious. Uh, there was a, a quote uh, you gave, I think, uh, maybe it was an in, in an interview with uh, The Believer, where you talk about what you were saying before with uh, being open to the world as an important part of the process. And then the, the irony being that uh, if you sort of try to be open to the world, it, it uh, sort of folds in on itself. Yeah, right. Like, you, it, like I'm, I think I might have been talking about that Henry James quote that's always confused me, but stuck with me. But like the novel is supposed to be someone on whom nothing is lost, right? Mm -hmm. But... But, but, but it's like, you don't want to, you know, like, I know certain people who like you're talking to them and you feel like they're already taking notes for like, they're already kind of like planning to write this experience down or whatever. As if like, instead of having the experience, they're already transforming it into literature. So there's this weird way that, that you have to be open to, to receiving impressions that could go into your art. But if you're too focused on transforming life into literature, you can kind of miss the life part, you know, in the same way that now every time anything dramatic happens, we all like whip out our cell phones and film it to kind of prove that we're there. But of course we're not there because we've interposed the camera between us and the event. I don't have any solution to all those contradictions so much as to just kind of, 
kind of lives them. But yeah, I think, I think every writer I know comes up with some set of like weird individual r- rituals to try to get them into a position where the writing might happen. Um, but I, if it's not, it's not generalizable somehow. And it's not even generalizable for, for one individual. It kind of changes. I don't know. John Ashbery, who's you know, kind of a hero of mine, seems to always talk about writing as so painless. You know, he always quotes as kind of like, oh, I'd put on some music, I'd have a glass of wine, I'd write for an hour, then I would like take it out of the drawer two weeks later. And I was like, oh, I wrote the self-portrait in a convex mirror. Like I just kind of accidentally wrote this masterpiece or whatever. I don't know if it's, I think he might be lying. I think you can work work harder than that, but it's not it's not that way. From although sometimes you know, like you sometimes it does. Sometimes it's easy, and then that's like really crazy. Like you sit down and you do just write and write and write, and what you wrote was real. And then it's kind of like, oh, maybe it's going to be like that next time. And like instead, it isn't. You know, like I wrote my first my first book of poems. I wrote like fifteen of the fifty poems in that book in like one night, and then I took five years to write the rest. <laughs> And and I just can't tell you why or or how. It's totally mysterious to me. Which makes it all all the worse feeling uh, while you're trying to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's it's. I mean, it's great and it's horrible. It's great because it's exciting and mysterious at moments, but it's horrible because it's just not it's not reliable. Now, both this book and and uh, your first book, Leaving the Torture Station, are at least to the reader very obviously based on you. But then. Um, but then it's hard to tell what's what's real and, and what isn't. And and I think uh, as a reader, it seems like one would want to assume more more is real than, than it actually is. Um, have you faced any, I don't know, have there been any consequences of, of drawing on your own framework uh, as the the loose architecture of the, of your stories so much? I mean, there's mo- there come mild consequences in the sense that, you know, I think like the, the, the you know, the first narrator in particular is like this really neurotic, solipsistic person. And sometimes I meet people who know the book before they know me. And you, I kind of wonder, like, are they interacting with me? Or are they interacting with the, the the narrator of the novel? And, um, but, you know, there aren't huge consequences because like the people who really know you know the difference. And then the people who don't know you, you don't know. <laughs> so you don't, you don't, kind of, you don't interact with them in the same way. I mean, I think it would be different if my narrator were like, a, you know, a, a, a serial killer or something. Like then it would really be, be kind of weird if you were interacting with people and they were wondering if you had like bodies in the closet or something. But, but I, I think that... Um, you know, I, I, what I want is the reason why I'm very interested, as you know, in the boundary between art and life. And so in the book, I want there to be that charge, that question about like, where does one begin and the other end? But then my actual life, I, you know, I'm kind of like, I don't think it really does anything to know if, you know, I, if I knew this person in Spain or that person's made up, or if I was, you know, um, in New York during Hurricane Sandy or not, or if that's made up. Like, I think, I think the actual, I think the question is kind of interesting and important for the work, the question of what's real and what isn't. But I think the actual answer is totally boring and kind of irrelevant, if that makes sense. It's the, it's the charge of the question that matters, not the, the facts um, of my own life, which I, I just, I don't think are very, interesting i mean they're interesting to me because i because it's my life but i don't they're not very interesting and in, you know in, in any general sense i want to to end off by asking you a bit about sort of how politics uh, play into all of this i mean mm-hmm. um the book ends uh, with the narrator sort of uh stuck on the precipice of of multiple different different futures uh between uh becoming a possible father and his uh, health problems uh, and it's left left open Earlier, uh, we were talking about, I think, the, the particular place that sort of America and the world finds itself in right now, where there's this sort of odd sense of stagnation that almost nothing's possible. There's been a bit of uh, fighting up against that, like Occupy. But can you just talk about the, the connection between those two, like the coming um, problems we have with things like environmental degradation and climate change and, and capitalism and this place where things could either be different or, or they might not be? Yeah, I mean, I think what's what's really exciting and terrifying about the present is that a lot of the organizing fictions of like the American empire are totally crumbling. 
you know, like that, that, that very few people believe that there's something called the free market that solves all our problems. And very few people believe the American rhetoric of, of freedom and democracy, given, um, how aware people are increasingly of the way that those are covers for all kinds of private interests um, and exploitation of common resources. So I think that, you know, I I think we're at a moment where um, a kind of contradictory moment where on the one hand, like capitalism seems to be doing a pretty good job of destroying itself. And on the other hand, we don't really have clear images of what the alternatives are. And I think that that's a, that's a moment that's both vertiginous and full of possibility. And it's also a moment for artists to be, you know, some of the people who are trying to imagine telling stories about the future um, beyond the, the kind of the existing order. I mean, David Graeber has this really interesting, I mean, many people have said a version of this, but he's really clear, this interesting fact about our moment, right? Which is that like neoliberalism has been a total failure as an economic policy, right? Like it, it clearly doesn't work. Like the banks have to be bailed out, blah, blah, blah. Like um, it's, it's got no solution to environmental catastrophe, far from it. But it's been a total triumph ideologically in the sense that all of us are kind of like, but there's nothing else that could work, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, it, clearly, it clearly doesn't work on the one hand as an actual uh, economic project, but it seems like unassailable ideologically because we keep accepting it as the only reality. And his challenge, right, is to say like, well, let's not accept it as the only reality. Let's accept the part that it doesn't work and let's try to imagine other forms of human association. And I think that's kind of the moment we're in. And it's it's a scary moment, but it's not a moment without possibility. And I think some version of that moment is because it's our moment is where the narrator ends up at the end of the book there's no resolution or closure that would be false it's more about this kind of threshold of possibility uh, and not all the possibilities are rosy but but they're real and are you optimistic i mean it on, on just the theme of uh, climate change which is plays a big part of the background of of the book um I mean, it seems it's odd because there's such pressure to change in a way because it's necessary, um, uh, and at the same time, that so, almost seems to take away the the ability to imagine in an odd way. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's something like the line that's typically attributed to Gramsci, right? The pessimism of reason and the optimism of will, like. Like, I, you know, there, nobody needs more reasons to despair like that. We've got plenty of information that could justify that. But, you know, there's nothing interesting or enabling about despair. So one has to be interested and open and maintaining a position of informed wonder before the world and to try to be alive to possibilities as they present themselves. Um so, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic <laughs> by nature, but I, but I do, I do think that, that, that kind of art and politics both depend upon the kind of resources of the imagination and, and depend upon thinking beyond the kind of uh, neoliberal repetition of, a, of like a kind of fake market is the only option. Price is the only measure of value. The, the, the extraction of wealth from the planet is the only way to relate to it, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So you kind of optimistic or not, we're going to have to get creative. And I guess, uh, fi- you know, it's another example of fiction uh, impacting reality, because of course, if yeah. we don't think there's possibilities and it predestines that there won't be any. Exactly, exactly. Well, I think uh, the, your book certainly uh, helps with uh, imagining different uh, scenarios and being open to the possibilities. I, I really enjoyed the book. And uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much for Thank coming you. on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for talking to me.